So tonight um, is our last night of this series, God of Covenant, and uh, we are going to be studying the new covenant that uh, we see uh, specifically in Jeremiah 31, um, that we see the Lord promise a new covenant to his people. And then we're going to look at some of the New Testament passages that uh, are of the fulfillment of the new test of this new covenant. Um, but before we do that, what are what are some of the things just kind of refresh as we've been going through this this study? This is our uh, fifth week in this study. Uh, what are some things that have stuck out that you remember that you feel like are important to bring up? Just once again, yeah, Brian. I drew a picture. Did you really? Yes. Yeah. 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 Specifically, yeah. Emmanuel. That's cool. That's a beautiful picture. I don't know if your drawing was beautiful, <laughs> but what you said was beautiful. <laughs> Thank you, Lord, <laughs> for your beauty. <laughs> what else? Anything else um, to before we get going to kind of whet our appetite? Yes, right. The royal, the royal grant covenant um, compared to the. Um, Caesarian vassal covenant, which is more of a still kind of top down, but it's um, more of a handshake covenant. There's 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 things attached. Make sure you follow your end. Yeah. Uh, I, I want to just thank the Lord for last week covering the church. Yeah. Church. Yeah. The godly covenant. You make things a silly. Yeah. Yeah, no. So if you weren't able to join us Sunday night, we um, went through the whole building, prayed over every single room, anointed the building, anointed the outside property, and, and just believe that uh, God has great things in storage. So just another, not that this church hasn't ever committed this building property to the Lord, but just once again, Lord, we come before you and commit this. This is This is for him and him alone. Nothing else will happen here. We anointed the car in the parking lot, and the police came and towed it out of here last night. So praise the Lord. <laughs> and my fingerprints are on it because I went like this. So <laughs> it's it's evidence. <laughs> yeah. 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 It's cool because um, we're going to spend some time in Hebrews tonight. And the book of Hebrews is really, that's the whole purpose of Hebrews. It's like this. Uh, we have these old covenants, and now we have the fulfilled. We have this flat, two-dimensional picture. Now we have live, breathing, fresh, fresh uh, human God with us. And so... Uh, we we are going to get into that a little bit tonight. So just to kind of pick up, uh, we left off last week with the Davidic covenant, King David. Uh, God promises him that through your line, um, you your kingdom, this kingdom is going to have someone in your line forever, pointing to Jesus. And uh, we know kind of just historically from David, David's son Solomon becomes the king after him, and he um, he has a great reign. He builds the temple. God comes down and uh, meets the people there at the dedication of the temple, and things are going good. And then Solomon starts to have a little bit too much prosperity and starts to turn his heart. His heart gets turned away towards other foreign gods. And then uh, we, we see him kind of come back at the end of his life, but there was a lot of damage done there. And then when Solomon's son uh, takes over, it, he, he's kind of a weaker king, and the kingdom does not 
uh, does not stand. It, it splits between the ten northern tribes and the two southern tribes, which which become Judah. Uh, Judah becomes its own nation, and uh, we see the kingdom of Israel. They they really they don't have a good track record of following God, the northern kingdom, and they fall off pretty quick, um, and, and end up getting exiled to Assyria. Um, wait. Am I saying, is it right? Yeah, yeah, Assyria. And then uh, we see Judah last quite a bit longer, several generations longer, um, but they also end up turning away and kind of follow the path of the Northern Kingdom and um, and and break away, break this covenant that, that God established, this this uh, covenant through, through Moses and the law, and they abandon God. And so God sends them into exile too through, through the nation of Babylon. And um, and it's just heartbreaking to see this is God's chosen people. We talked about this Sunday, like I planted this vine. I t- plucked you out of Egypt and I put you in the ground, this rich soil to grow up. I gave you everything that you needed. And yet you turned away, you became this wild vine. You turned away, you, you turned away from me. Um, and then we see um, several, even 100 years later, uh, we we have prophets coming and they are speaking against uh, these nations that are becoming corrupt and going afoul, and um, and we see God. He even though the people have turned, even though He's bringing judgment upon them, it's not a com- it's 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 discipline. It's not uh, okay. You're done. Whatever whatever happens happens. It's I'm going to do this to you so that you can come back and fulfill this plan that I have, this rescue plan that I have for the world. And um, so we see that. So let's turn to Jeremiah chapter 31, verses 31 through 34. And I'm reading from my NASB version tonight. Uh, Starting in verse 31, chapter 31, verse 31. Behold, days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. Not like the covenant which I made with their fathers in the day that I took them up by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt, my covenant which they broke, although I was a husband to them, declares the Lord. But this is the covenant which I will make with the house of Israel after those days, declares the Lord. I will put my law within them, and on their heart I will write it. And I will be their God, and they shall be my people. They will not teach again, each man his neighbor and each man his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for they will all know me. From the least of them to the greatest of them, declares the Lord. For I will forgive their iniquity and their sin, and I will remember it no more. Uh, we have this this new covenant, this new thing that God kind of gives a glimpse of to his people. There will be a day when I will write my law on your heart. It's no longer going to be on these tablets of stone. It's no longer going to be um, in, a, in a place where we see the Hebrews, they, they have the tablets of stone. They have the law written on the tablets, but on their heart is written the sin. And... God says that I'm going to give you a heart after after me. I'm going to give you a heart that understands my law. And so you're not going to you're not going to be failing. You're not going to be falling away at that time. Um this is what I got um as I was doing some of my research. Uh three distinct promises. He would give them the ability and the desire to follow him. He would change their hearts and give them a zeal for obedience. He will be their God and they will be his people and he will forgive the sins of his people. And uh, if you if you read through the major prophets and, and the minor prophets as well, you see there's a lot of uh, God treats this sin that uh, Israel and Judah have fallen away, this idolatry of chasing other gods. Uh, he, he views it as, a, as adultery. And it is, he has made this covenant with this people, just like we talk about when we have a wedding, there is a marriage covenant, there is a, a coming together, and yet the people have, have left and there has gone after other things, gone chasing the wrong things. And 
to God, it is this adulterous act that the people have done through their um, through their worship of other gods. And so just think of like the betrayal and the hurt and the damage that, that gets done when we see that in, in someone's marriage here. And, um, and just how hard that would be. And yet God still says, I will forgive your sins. I will make you right before me. I will teach you. I'll change you. I will change you. You don't have to change yourself. I'm going to bring you in and change you. And um, this is an incredible promise. And so this is the promise of the new covenant, that there will be another stage to this. And just like Brian shared with his drawing, uh, that there, we see this progression continue. And um, so I want to kind of flip ahead to Hebrews chapter 8. And um, we don't know who the author of Hebrews is. There's a lot of speculation of who it was. Uh, Some people think that it it could have been the Apostle Paul. That was kind of like the long running thought for a long time. Uh, But modern scholars don't believe that it was him. Um, Some people actually think that it was, um, yeah, Apollos possibly. Uh, Apollos, one of the, the guys who was kind of running around in Acts, uh, some people think that it was actually maybe Aquila, a woman, wrote the book of Hebrews. And um, it, it's possible. We, we don't know. The author is not explicit. And so um, it, it's, a, it's an interesting book. But the book of Hebrews, we kind of already talked about um, a little bit. But if you read through the introduction, it's a book that's written to Christians who are of a a Hebrew uh, lineage, Hebrew family. And so the author is writing to these people and saying, you you understand what the law is. And really, even in the time of Jesus, we have um, what has come into party, into power, the Pharisees. We've heard of the Pharisees. The Pharisees were the conservative group that said the the Mosaic law, we got to follow it. They had started like making new laws so that they could follow the old laws. Um, it's like having a meeting about a meeting. And um, so they kind of like were kicking it up a notch. But that that was all in response to the really the, the religion becoming more of like a liberal religion with the Sadducees. And the Sadducees, um, they, they believed like in principle, but they didn't believe in action. And so the Pharisees came along and they said, no, that's not right. We're, we're zealous for the law. We're zealous for what our father Moses set in place, what our God wants to do. And so the Pharisees were actually the conservative party in Jesus's time. And I think that's really interesting when we um, consider how much Jesus had to say about the Pharisees. And because we know we're obviously a much more conservative uh, Christian group where there are a lot of liberal Christian groups, not politically liberal, but religiously liberal, where it's more of a of an idea or a talking point. But we believe that, no, we, we follow the Sermon on the Mount. We follow the teachings of Jesus. We believe in the power of the Holy Spirit and in action and in gifts and, um, and all of these things. Um, and so I always am like wondering, okay, the Pharisees were getting it wrong. <laughs> We got to make sure we don't slip and go that far with the pendulum as well. But we have something that they didn't have, and, and that's the Holy Spirit. Um, and so we can we can stand and rest assured in the Holy Spirit. But if if we start to move on without the Spirit, is when we can get into trouble, and when Jesus will will rebuke us in a loving, disciplining way. Um, but we see, okay, so in this book of Hebrews. Uh, the author is comparing all of these things. Okay, with the law, we have this. And with the law, we have that. And with the law, we have this. But every single time we have something in the law, we have Jesus, who's a better representation of what we had in the law. We have Jesus, who is a better high priest. We have Jesus, who is uh, the, the true Messiah. We have Jesus, who is the true sacrifice, the sacrifice to end all sacrifices. And, um, and so we see this. And so this is kind of where we're at. We're picking this up kind of in the middle of this uh, right here. And so we're going to, I just want to read verse six first. Uh, Hebrews chapter eight, verse six. It says, but now he has obtained a more excellent ministry by as much as he is also the mediator of a better covenant 
which has been enacted on better promises. That, that Jesus is a greater high priest, that Jesus is a greater mediator. He is able to mediate between God and us. He is able to 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 bring us and and um, bring us into this covenant. He's the he's the means for which we're able to en- enter into this covenant. And then continuing on in in starting in verse seven, uh, I'm just going to read verse seven. It says, "For if that first covenant had been faultless, there would have been no occasion." sought for a second covenant. And then we see um, the author quote that same passage from Jeremiah that we just read. And so I'm not going to read it again. Uh, But picking up down in verse 13, it says, when he said a new covenant, he has made the first obsolete, but whatever is becoming obsolete and growing old is ready to disappear. So we're not bound to the old covenant that God made, that, that God has made. He has given us something new, something better. And uh, we see, again, um, I kind of want to look at a couple different passages here in the New Testament. I want to read John chapter 1, verse 29. And on Sunday mornings, I always just have it typed out so I don't have to flip through all the pages, but (laughs) we're flipping pages tonight. (laughs) Uh, John chapter 1, verse 29, it said, The next day he saw Jesus coming to him and said, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. In Hebrews, uh, back in Hebrews in chapter 9, it goes on to have this passage of, uh, the old and the new covenant, and there's like this comparison uh, between between the two. And I want to kind of pick this up in verse 23. So this is Hebrews 9:23. <clears throat> Therefore, it was necessary for the copies of the things in the heavens to be cleansed with these, but the heavenly things themselves with better sacrifices than these. For Christ did not enter into a holy place made with hands, a mere copy of the true one, but into heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of God for us. Nor was it that he would offer himself often as the high priest enters the holy place year by year with blood that is not his own. Otherwise he would have needed to suffer often since the foundation of the world. But now once at the at the consummation of the ages, he has been manifested to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. And inasmuch as it is appointed for men to die once, and after this comes judgment, so Christ also, having been offered once to bear the sins of many, will appear a second time for the salvation without reference to sin to those who eagerly await him. It's talking about justification. Justification through Christ's sacrifice, for us, and when we um, look at this, is like Jesus is the one who who even talks about this. And uh, I want to jump back to the Book of Mark. This is Jesus in the upper room with the disciples on the night that he was betrayed, and we just um, you know partook in communion this Sunday. And this is uh, Jesus's words here. Um. Mark 14, 22 through 24. While they were eating, he took some bread, and after a blessing, he broke it and gave it to all of them and said, Take it, this is my body. And when he had taken a cup and given thanks, he gave it to them, and they all drank from it. And he said to them, This is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many. This is my blood of the covenant. He, he says, I'm, I'm establishing something new. We're doing something new here. And my blood is going to take the place of all of these animal sacrifices that have happened for, for hundreds of years up to this point. All of this death that has needed to happen to, to make people uh, even approach a right relationship with God. Now they're going to be able to have a real right relationship, and it's going to be through 
the perfect lamb, the perfect lamb of God, Jesus Christ. Um, and then 2 Corinthians chapter 3. Do you guys ever try to like race to see who can turn? First one there. <laughs> Chapter three, verses five and six. Um, not that we are adequate in ourselves to consider anything as coming from ourselves, but our adequacy is from God who also made us adequate as servants of a new covenant, not of the letter, but of the spirit. For the letter kills, but the spirit gives life. Um, you know, what a beautiful thing that we have in Jesus. And um, I, I thought it was really interesting going through this study as well that that there is this progression, there's this move from a, a general to a more specific, more specific, more specific, as we've studied these previous four covenants uh, that God made with his people. And I, I thought that it was really interesting that, that Jesus and his covenant, it, it really overtakes them all. It, it fulfills them all and in a much better way. And we see that in the Noahic covenant that God, um, you know, he, he wipes everybody out except for this one family. And then he puts his rainbow in the sky and he says, when you see this rainbow, just know that I'm never going to wipe everybody out again, that you'll be able to live. And then when we look at, you know, John three sixteen, what does it say? It says that whoever believes in him will live. They're not going to die. They're never going to die. We're never going to die. We're never going to experience this uh, eternal death. We're going to have eternal life in Christ. And, and so we see Jesus fulfilling the Noahic covenant in, a, in an eternal way. Uh, we see Jesus fulfilling the Abrahamic covenant that was this inheritance um, that uh, here again in Hebrews chapter 9, verse 15, it says, For this reason he is the mediator of a new covenant, so that since a death has taken place for the redemption of the transgression that were committed under the first covenant, those who have been called may receive the promise of the eternal inheritance. That God promises Abraham, I'm going to give you, like, he, he has this, um, Abraham is upset because he, he has all of this wealth. God has blessed him. He has accrued so many things, but he says, I have nobody to give it to I have to give it to somebody who's just one of my servants. He's not even a relative of mine. And, and God says, no, I'm going to give you more than the sand on, this, on the seashore. I'm going to give you more than the stars in the heaven. And you're going you're gonna to be so incredibly blessed, you're not going to be able to believe it. You can't fathom it. And we see that our inheritance in Christ is an eternal inheritance. And it's not, it's not something that we have in a, in a lifetime, in a generation. It's something that lasts for eternity. Um, all through this, these two chapters in Hebrews, there's this comparison between the old covenant and the new covenant. And we see that it, it's a direct comparison to, to Moses and what Moses, what the covenant that God gives to, to the Israelites through the Mosaic covenant. And Jesus is the superior. He's the better at, in all ways. It's, it's the two-dimensional black and white picture to the live in, in the flesh, breathing in your face version that we have in Jesus. And then in the Davidic covenant, uh, we read this last week, but I want to read it again in Luke chapter 1. Um, God promises David, makes this covenant with him, that your, your, your royal lineage is going to last forever. And this is what the angel says to Mary. If I can turn. What'd you say? <laughs> okay, Luke chapter 1, verse 32. He will, he will be great, and he will be called the Son of the Most High. 
and the Lord God will give him the throne of his father, David. That Jesus is the one who receives this, this, uh, this promise, this covenant that, that you're going you're gonna to last forever. And even if we go back to the study on Revelations that Brian taught uh, several weeks ago, that we see that, that Christ, it, his work is, is, is completed by what he has done on the cross and what he has done in the resurrection, but, it, but it's not finished. Like he's coming back. And there's going to be a, like this, this finishing of all things where the heaven and earth will, will pass away and, and the new one will, will come up and it's going to be this incredible bridal party. Uh, the church will be made ready. And uh, we have this new covenant to, to look forward to. And so um, kind of as we've been studying through this tonight, just kind of these same questions that we've, we've asked every week, what, what does the story tell us about God's character? What does the story tell us about mankind? Why, why is this important? And how should the knowledge of this covenant make Christians, motivate Christians to live today? Yeah. 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 Right. I think I think our culture now it is similar in some ways to like there's a lot of like agnosticism in our culture. A lot of like I, there's something out there, but I'm not really interested in organized religion, and so I, I'm just not going to invest in the time to figure that out. Um, there's even these thoughts of like um, you know our founding fathers. They had this idea that God came and created the the earth and set it in place, but then He just left it, just just bounce, just peace, goodbye. Uh, you guys will figure it out. And um, but that's not that's not the picture that we have when we read through these. It's exactly like you said, Quinn, that God is interested in intimacy with us, and and He's He's jealous for us, and He wants us to to be in this right relationship with Him. It breaks His heart. There's a betrayal that happens when we separate ourselves from Him, and um, and it, it's, it was never intended to be that way, and yet that's the the path that we hum, humans have been on since since the garden. What else? Yeah, I would say so. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. 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 Right. Yeah. Yeah. It's like it's like you're you just went and did like a really hard workout or worked all day and you're all dirty and nasty and then you just go put clean clothes on. It's like people are living like that, but no, yeah. the Lord cleanses us. He he. Uh huh. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. 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 I think like that made me think of when like it, it, it's such a blessing that God is like he's just so gentle with humankind. He he lets us know like centuries before this thing has come to place 
so that when Jesus comes and starts to fulfill prophecy after prophecy after prophecy after prophecy, and you actually are willing to eyes wide open look at what he has accomplished and what has been uh, like forespoken about him, that he is um, that that people can like like study it. Like Paul goes and he reasons with the people in the synagogues, and it's not his that his. What he his educating them was was leading them to not accept Jesus. It was this hard heart that time and time again he would get kicked out of the synagogue, or someone else would come in and rile everybody up, and and there's just this fear of oh we're gonna lose what we have, we're gonna lose this little bit of ground that we have when we literally have the promise of God right in front of us, and we have the the living God who will come and live within us and the Holy Spirit. And um, so, yeah, I, I see that as well. This uh, we have to, we have to choose to see. We have to be willing to to let the scales fall from our eyes. We have to be willing to be um, looking past what we think is best and looking to join ourselves with what God is actually doing. Yeah. Yeah. Every t- every time I read 2 Corinthians, I'm like surprised at how much I love that book. <laughs> I love 2 Corinthians. It's like it's kind of like a like a sneaky incredible like epistle in the Bible. <laughs> it, the, you think of like 1 Corinthians and you know we have the the love chapter and you think of Romans and you think of like maybe Philippians or uh, Timothy like one of one of these other books the book of James, Hebrews, but I like nobody talks about 2 Corinthians. I love 2 Corinthians. It's so rich. Anything else? Anybody have any more comments about this or or right, how about this question? Uh, maybe even in consideration of all all five of these covenants that we have studied, what, how should the knowledge of these covenants motivate us as as Christians to follow? How can how can learning more motivate us? How can we apply this to our lives? Or and instead of it just becoming head knowledge and oh yeah, I I have facts about that. How how can this move us to live closer to Christ. Donnie. Well, what I see the United States is exactly what the United States All of them you went through and everything is exactly what the United States is doing. They're turning everything back. Yeah. To the, giving it all back to the devil or whatever. And Christians see that and they know how to pray against it. Yeah. They against it and raise their children like they're supposed to pray. Yeah. Yeah. Because there there is a there is a risk involved in following Jesus. Like Jesus doesn't say follow me and it's gonna be rainbows and butterflies. He says, Follow me and pick up your cross. And just like those men and women in the old test or in the New Testament who are afraid of getting thrown out of the synagogue, afraid of losing their way of life, it's just like us in some extent, but think about the people like in the Middle East who Jesus is appearing to in dreams and they live in a country where it's illegal to become Christian and yet they give their life to Christ. But there's this risk they're going to lose their entire family and everyone that they love. They could get killed because of it. Uh, Here in our country, we're probably just going to lose some position, maybe lose an opportunity, lose uh, whatever, lose something. But you're right, Donnie. We have to stand. We have to, we have to, fo- we have to see what is of the kingdom and join in with that. Join in with what God is doing, not with whatever, we, whatever we feel like we can grab onto in the here and the now in the worldly way. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Got to show your faith. What were you going to say, Christine? Yeah.
Yeah. That's good. That's really good. I think that's when we come together in a prayer meeting or we come together even on a night like this and just lift up people that we know about and we're saying, no, now is the time. It's time to come out of the gutter. It's time to come out of brokenness. It's time to come out of out of cancer. You know, and, and, and it's not necessarily people, like nobody's choosing to have cancer, but we're gonna speak this truth and the reality of heaven that, that you were not meant to have that and Jesus is able to heal you. Jesus, would you heal this person? He's the healer. And, um, and, and we're gonna see him come and do these works. We're gonna lay hands and see people delivered. We're gonna call the enemy out and tell him he can go run and hide. There's other places he can go. This is no longer his area. And that's what we're gonna do, but we're gonna have to stand because there's gonna be trials attached to that. And, and there's a risk involved when we step into the, the like this, this razor's edge of following Jesus. Um, there's this risk that if we don't go down to this dangerous spot, then we're, we're not gonna be effective. But if we do, then we could end up falling over. <laughs> and yet this is where Jesus says, come on, I want you here. Come on, come be with me. Come on, come and do this with me. It's gonna be crazy. It's gonna be wild. And there's gonna be uh, a hundredfold results that will fo follow it. Yeah, it is narrow. And I think people have taken that scripture and interpreted it in such a way that they would say, well, just not that many people are going to come and follow Jesus. But I, I would take that scripture and interpret it as it just means like it's, it's tight. <laughs> You're going to have to get uncomfortable and follow it. And it's not going to be easy. Uh, and so probably a large portion are going to take the easy path, but the road is narrow that that leads to Christ and, and we got to follow him. Yeah. 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 Right. Well, and even like you think about like the parable of the great banquet where the, the master of the house sends his servants out and invites the people in and they make these excuses. Can't do it. Can't do it. Can't do it. And he just is like, no, there will be people at this banquet. There, this will, like the word of the Lord, the promises will not return void. There will be people that will respond to his grace. Yeah, because they're valuable to him. He said, bring them in. I'm going to feed them. We're going to throw a party. And um, that's what we, as his church, that's what we're the messengers, right? Yeah. Yeah. I I've that's a that's a real issue in our culture today in American Christianity. That's a real issue. And we can't we can't settle for it. So it's gonna take back this because in our hearts we're changing we want to we want Sarah Christ in our heart to change. And uh so we recognize that it's gonna press us on.
I, I honestly I I think that we might already be to that point where it's gotten so hard that we've seen like my generation I mean we've seen people grow up in the church and walk away left and right and uh, younger generations as well but here's the thing with that that as we have seen these generations to say you know distance myself from the church deconvert whatever um deconstruct my faith then we they, we have them raising their kids with with nothing they're, they're called the generation of the nuns where they they check on the box like america has has typically always been like we get a survey you check on the box even if you go to church once every five years you check christian or you check something you're just like christian by by association but now they're checking they're f- f- willing to check none I, I don't even, I don't really need to even nominally associate myself with that, but they're raising up kids who have no, it's just like a blank slate, but there's this hunger, the spiritual hunger within. And, and if we can present the gospel, they will receive the gospel because there is real power in, in what we have to offer. And there is real life in what we have to offer. And we have the greatest hope this world has ever known in Jesus Christ. Yeah. I agree. Yeah. Yeah. And let it be. And let it, let us be a part of that. Let us be a conduit for, for his grace. What were you going to say, Brian? Uh, yeah, the old covenant and an all the Old Covenant who is showing sending his son, he is also speaking. Yeah. Now we have Jesus, but even Jesus tells his disciples that he's the way to truth and life. He's the way to the Father. Mm-hmm. And I think that presently, uh, back in verse 11, we had the people who live by faith, and they had their mindset on um, that they didn't even receive. They didn't see it. Um, and they hadn't even seen the Messiah. They didn't, yeah. have, they, they didn't have the new covenant. Yet. Yeah. Um, we have the new covenant. We have grace, and I think in regards to how this influences the way we live, I think the church needs to be reminded of their, their living hope. Yeah. Because what Jesus has done for the at the ministry of reconciliation, we're talking, you reconcile to God. But it's because we haven't even yet seen the, just like the rest of them, having to see the, the full fruition of this. We haven't seen the kingdom, we haven't seen the, the glory of our Father. Yeah. Face to face yet. Right. And so we have this new and better covenant. But there are way better things in this world that are coming. People will put all their trust in Jesus Christ. Yeah. And so I think that we understand that we're eternally minded. Uh, that it helps us because I think I don't want this. Yeah. And I don't want self righteousness the other way. I, I, I'm going to put my trust in Jesus. He's yeah. the only one who can get me here. Yeah. And, yeah, and like life is just so much better when we follow Christ. It it is, it is not boring. It is not about the don't do this, don't do that. It is about a rich, full, dangerous, wild, crazy, uh, just f- fulfilling life, life and life abundant in Him in this life, and then just even wilder to to what's what will what will come. We have this two-dimensional picture of the of the old covenant. We have this 3D in the flesh, living, breathing God with us in the new covenant. Well, what's what's going to happen when Christ returns? Like, how much greater, exponentially greater, is it going to be? Yeah, we like like my dog is a lot stupider than me. My dog is is not smart for a dog. Period. But he's dogs are not as smart as people, and I think about like the things that I know compared to the things that my dog knows, and the power that I have compared to what he has is like is not like it, there is a there is a vast difference. <laughs> there is a vast difference, and um, 
And I just think about that and I put myself in, in my dog's dumb shoes and I'm like, Lord, your ways are so much higher than my ways. And all of these ideas that I have that I'm going to run out and be first in the pack and, and I'm going to like go and, you know, swim for who knows how long or whatever and chase this and just bring it back and drool everywhere. Like all of these things that I'm doing and, and God is like, okay, just, just follow me, stick with me, bud. <laughs> it's going to be okay. Like there's good stuff at the end of this. Come, come and do it right. And, um, he is the, the master who his ways are just so unfathomable. We, we cannot see the depths of them. Yeah. I'm just like the golden retriever that's like, you're my new best friend. <laughs> yeah, they do. Well, I think sometimes we think we're smarter than God. And um, so I, I always like think of that as a parable for for us. <laughs> but <laughs> yeah, <laughs> be humbled by it. Uh, let's pray and um, we'll kind of wrap up this whole series. Father, in Jesus' name, we, um, Lord, we thank you for your word. God, thank you that we can search your word, that we don't have to wait and try to, to hear what you would say to us because you have already spoken to us. And we can open up your living, breathing word, and we can study and, and see all of these things. Lord, thank you for the wisdom that, that you have imparted through good teachers through the centuries. Thank you for your spirit that leads us. And Lord, thank you that we can study these covenants, God, that you would show so much mercy to reach down into humanity, a broken humanity, a, a betraying humanity. And yet you would say, I still want you and I will still make a way for you. And God, we see you do this time and time again. And it is uh, come to fulfillment in Jesus Christ. And so, Lord, just once again, even here, Lord, we, we give our lives to Jesus. We give our lives to, to your church, to your bride, and we pray that you would make your bride ready and, and use us to be a part of that change. We pray that you would bring people into your church, the people that are just all around us, just dying, chasing their own little whatever it is that they're chasing. And God, you have so much, something so much greater for us. And so I pray that you would uh, let us become greater vessels of your hope. Let us become greater vessels of your grace. Let us be willing to uh, set aside our own plans, our own dreams, and, and invest in your kingdom and what you desire to do. Let us uh, be people who, who, nothing, um, who, who nothing would get in the way of us following you, not our own self-righteousness, not our own ideas, not our own um, prerogatives or, or whatever we have, Lord, not our own families, not our own anything would get in the way of what it looks like to follow you. Let us be people who will continually say yes to you. And I pray that you would just spur us on, Lord, let, let us study on these covenants, especially your new covenant that we have in your own blood. Spur us on to what you have in store. And I pray that you would use us, use this church, use your church here in this city to, uh, to make this city and this county a bright light for you uh, and turn people's hearts towards you. Let them come to find salvation in you. And pray all of these things in Jesus' good, mighty, powerful, victorious name. Amen. Amen.